Today's presentation is a tour of the Iowa Arboretum and Gardens. Uh, and we have two presenters today, Executive Director Mark Schneider and the Curator of Collections, David McKinney. Executive Director Schneider will be providing the history and organizational aspects of the garden, such as their master plan and Arboretum philosophy. Curator McKinney will be focusing on the plants in their collection and which perform well in Iowa. Executive Director Schneider, the floor is yours. Thank you, Byron. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today on a January day. And David and I will be talking about one of our favorite topics, the Iowa Arboretum. And I'm gonna be looking at more of the larger picture of what the Arboretum is and uh, what it uh, has become. And David is gonna look at our collections and give you a tour of our garden. Uh, next. So our mission is the Iowa Arboretum and Gardens is an aspiring the value and use of landscape. And next. So our vision is, the Arboretum's vision is to develop, maintain, and grow the premier Iowa collection of trees, landscape plants, and native ecosystems. Next. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our history and what makes up the Iowa Arboretum. So we were established in 1968, and we're 160 acres established by the Iowa State Horticultural Society. Uh, on their 100th anniversary, they were they were an organization that was established in 18, uh, 1868, and 100 years later, they wanted to wanted an arboretum. Uh, for all, all Iowans to enjoy and to serve the greater Iowa, state of Iowa. So 40 acres were purchased in 1968 in Boone County, Iowa, which is really a, a rural area of Iowa. Uh, we're surrounded by woodland, we're surrounded by farmland, uh, and we were established as a 501c3 organization. So today, we're an independent organization. Uh, uh, the Iowa State Horticultural Society is no, no longer operating in the organization. Uh, we're, again, we're a 501c3 organization. Uh, we have a board of 26 uh, board members. And we have a staff of five. And we have volunteers. And like mo most uh, public gardens, uh, volunteers play a very big part in how the Arboretum operates. Um, so we're staff directed and volunteer supported. Our board does tremendous things, lending their skill sets to uh, helping us and guiding us. Um, our volunteer, other volunteers work on our grounds and events and all kinds of things that really help drive the IO Arboretum to be successful. Our focus is on collections. When we were established, it was about uh, collections. Our Arboretum is divided up into different areas that feature different types of collections. And that has shifted a little bit. David will tell you a little bit more about that later on, but uh, we haven't lost that focus, which is back to growing plants that can grow in Iowa. And our focus is on uh, the different types of collections. So in 2019, we made a shift and added Iowa Arboretum and Gardens onto our name and moved towards not having straight collections, but having collections integrated into gardens. 
and that was a uh, it was a pivot for us, but it was a good one for us. And we felt like people wanted to see more garden areas, and we felt this was a, a different way to show people and also to attract uh, more people to the Arboretum. So botanical gardens, Arboretum, public gardens have to be more than just, and I'm not saying just plants, but it has to be more than plants. And we have done that. We've moved towards having different types of cultural events uh, this year, excuse me, this past year, we started a concert series and that was very successful for us. We have a number of other events that go on, but if we look for different ways to attract different uh, demographic uh, to the Arboretum. And uh, this was one way that we did that. We have a number of events that go on throughout the year. We have, uh, we're dog friendly, so we have a lot of dog events uh, that, uh, at the Arboretum. We have holiday events revolving around different types of holidays. In the early spring, we have a run, we celebrate Arbor Day. So we have different types of events that go on throughout the year. We also hold a number of life events at the Arboretum. Uh, we have weddings, we have different types of meetings, professional meetings, um, all different types of uh, events, uh, anniversaries, all types of things that go on throughout the year and people utilize the Arboretum for those uh, special life events. Well, education is in our mission and education is an important part of the Iowa Arboretum, uh, whether it's attracting young people to the Arboretum. Uh, we have a symposium in early spring where we invite nationally known speakers to come to the Arboretum and share their, their knowledge and uh, their interest in different aspects of horticulture. Um, so education is, is an important part of who we are as a public garden. So our future in, next. In 2018, we completed our master plan. And our master plan gave us the roadmap for future development of the Arboretum. And another important part of this was that uh, this past year, uh, David and I sat down and we worked on a, a garden uh, master plan to fit into our overall master plan. So those two components now make up our master plan. Our master plan is for the original 40 acres, which is on the left side, um, uh, of this map that David's circling. Uh, in 2018, we bought the L-shaped piece of land. That's 80 acres. So all total, which you're looking at is 120 acres. Plus we have another 40 acres that were given to us uh, in 2012, which is not on this map, but it's 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 north and west of this piece of property. There's a piece of farmland between us. So all total, we're 160 acres. So we're the largest at 160 acres and the oldest um, arboretum in Iowa. So this master plan is made up of a lot of different components. What we did is we had a um, survey done and found out what people really were thinking about the Arboretum as we developed our master plan. And people wanted more experiences with wildlife, wanted more educational opportunities, um, and they wanted more um, opportunities to be outdoors on trails. With that, we developed our master plan, which has a, a trails through woodland areas. David, if you can kind of circle that area. Oops. And uh, 
opportunities to attract uh, different demographics, such as children, and uh, to experience the outdoors, which uh, this master plan allows us to do. Next. Our master plan looks at a variety of things, including children's garden, uh, a victory garden, outdoor classroom, uh, water features, art in the garden. As I said earlier, gardens have to be, public gardens have to be more than just uh, just plants. And we have taken our master plan and really uh, worked on um, doing that. Next. One of the biggest projects we're working on right now is called our family engagement project, Treehouse Village. Uh, the Arboretum uh, is, as I said earlier, located in a rural part of, of Iowa. And we wanted to attract young families, hopefully with children, uh, to the Arboretum. It's a demographic that we really don't attract a lot of people to the Arboretum to enjoy. And we thought that this would be a great way to do it. And part of our master plan was to provide those opportunities. So, so what we did was um, we're working with a company out of North Carolina and we're designing a place that has tree houses and all inclusive play area out in our woodland area. Uh, that allow children of all abilities and adults to enjoy an outdoor experience. And we've called it Treehouse Village. So one of the things that really impacted our collection was in 2020. And we were hit by a a storm called a derecho. And before this time, which was August 10th, 2020, I hadn't even heard of what a derecho was. Uh, moving from the East Coast to the Midwest, it wasn't a word that we had in our vocabulary. But the reason I bring this forward to you is that it impacted our collections. And David will be talking about our collections, but I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what happened on August 10th, uh, 2020, uh, we were impacted by two major things. And, and one was the pandemic, which uh, really changed the way we did business, at least for the next two years. And then also the derecho. Derecho is a straight wind uh, storm, sometimes with rain, sometimes without rain, um, high winds, uh, we were impacted by over 140 mile an hour winds, lost over 300 trees uh, on our main campus where our collections are located, our major collections are located, and our woodland area, uh, some of the upland areas, uh, the, the woodland areas were fairly destroyed. We lost over 40% of our canopy. So many of the trees that were planted back when we were established in 1968, some of those early trees were just taken out. Uh, you can see a few of the pictures, um, um, a number of conifers uh, were destroyed. A lot of deciduous trees were destroyed and uh, really changed the look of the Arboretum. Luckily, our conifer garden uh, did fairly, fared fairly well, but the conifers that we had around the Arboretum the 40 acre arboretum, a lot of them did not do well. So with that, uh, David's gonna take over and give you a tour of the arboretum. And then I'll take questions later on if you have any. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. As Mark said, I am um, the curator of collections and grounds out at the Iowa Arboretum. Um, and I'll just show you some of uh, my favorite collections that we have um, out there on our main 40 acres and then a little bit about the woodland. Um, so to give you an idea of what we have after the derecho um, at the Arboretum, uh, planted on our main 40 acres, we have 550, um, 550 deciduous trees. 
Um, those range in age from um, over 50 years old to um, over 200 plants that were planted in the last two years. Um, with that, we have over 100 um, coniferous trees. That does not include our dwarf conifers. Um, we have 300 plus deciduous shrubs, um, over 150 coniferous shrubs, which includes our dwarf conifer collection, um, but uh, well over a thousand woody plants overall planted on 40 acres. Um, as Mark said, uh, before 2019, a lot of our plantings were collections based. And so we had a perennial garden and various other um, perennial collections planted throughout the Arboretum. And those are at an estimated total of about 2,000 uh, herbaceous perennial varieties. So the first garden that I'll take you through is our Jacobson conifer collection. Um, I just wanted to say that we are technically in zone 5A where we're at in the Iowa Arboretum. Um, we were talking about winter losses before this uh, meeting started and uh, we uh, pretty regularly get well below freezing. Um, it's actually 18 degrees uh, Fahrenheit right now um, in Des Moines. Um, and you can see behind me that uh, we have our little sunroom escape in my house uh, just to escape the winter. So things that grow at the Iowa Arboretum need to be pretty hardy um, and need to be able to survive uh, what the climate puts them through here in, in central Iowa. Um, this conifer garden is home to nearly 100 unique conifer varieties um, that range from full-size plants to our dwarf conifer collection. The oldest plants were uh, started in the early 80s, and we've just been planting it ever since. Um, this is um, an American Conifer Society reference garden and reference collection for us. Um, however, we have conifers planted all over the Arboretum that uh, also are part of that reference garden. Um, as you can see, um, we've got some, some old, um, pretty massive um, dwarf plants and regular sized trees. Um, this includes two huge creeping spruces, some weeping white pines, um, and some really great um, of my favorite plants that we have out there. Um, here you can see a, a Waits Golden and a, a, a Weeping Omorica Spruce. Um, you can see a lot of our dwarf uh, white pines, Japanese white pines in there. Um, got a lot of really great winter texture, winter color, as well as some just stunning summer pictures in this. Um, and we're always planting. I think we planted close to two dozen uh, additional dwarf conifers this past year um, to just keep filling in this garden, keep the collection growing, um, and to, to really uh, provide a really great reference collection for our guests. Um, this garden is about an acre in size, and so it's all surrounding that gazebo, um, and it also includes our alpine collection. So uh, this is a garden that we have been working on. It was established in 2011, um, and we've just continually added things like um, dwarf standard bearded irises and uh, things that need well-drained soil um, and just really adding to this alpine collection. Here is our um, pretty iconic gazebo, um, Jones Memorial Gazebo. And this is actually the highest point of elevation at the Arboretum. And so it's one of the few structures that you can see all over our main 40 acres. Um, and it just sits top a hill and you can basically see the rest of the Arboretum from this gazebo. Um, so it's a spectacular spot for things like weddings. We get a lot of events up here um, and it's some of uh, our guests' favorite places, guests and members' favorite places to go when they visit. Um, there's a pretty good shot of the Alpine Garden. You can just see uh, the gazebo in the back there up on the hill. Um, and what that collection looks like from a wide range shot. Um, and as I said, a lot of a uh, lot of really unique and fun dwarf conifers in there um, that are surviving pretty well um, to an open exposed climate in Iowa. So just some more some more great shots. Uh, you can see there in the back our little leaf bald cypress, uh, one of my favorite plants. It's a very wiry looking plant. 
Um, and I think this picture includes one of our dwarf ponderosa pines. So that was our most, um, most condensed conifer collection. However, um, some of our oldest trees planted at the Arboretum are in our Founders Grove. And so the Founders Grove began in 1970 uh, by Iowa Fort Society board members. Um, each of them pretty much beginning in 1968 got to plant a tree in their own honor for helping found the Arboretum. Um, this section is most of our oldest trees for that reason, um, and actually has the potential state champion three-flowered maple, um, and has housed many state champion trees in its past. Um, it has the oldest yellow horn tree in the state, and it once held the state champion southwestern white pine. Um, but one of the plants that I want to um, bring attention to is one of our bald cypresses that was planted in 1978. Um, it's at the end of one of our biggest loops and you can just see it just very iconically stands there along our fence line. It's just a massive, massive plant. Um, we also have a Pinus densiflora planted in 1983 and you can just see how beautiful and spectacular that plant is. Um, and it actually is in front of our governor's oaks. And so it has a really great green backdrop in the summer. Um, and we get questions about that plant pretty uh, pretty frequently. Um, one of our more unique plants that I'll draw your attention to is here on the right. Um, it is a, um, a sugar maple um, and it is called compact. Uh, we have one of the only specimens of this plant in existence, left in existence. Um, it was found by um, a former president of the Iowa Hort Society and um, the first horticulturist at the Arboretum. It's uh, perfectly teardrop shaped, it has a very dense canopy, and depending on the year, it has a really great yellow-orange fall color. Um, and we're really looking to get that plant out into the world because it would make a really great landscape plant for small spaces. It would look really great planted um, as a mass somewhere um, in like a public park or along streets. Um, it's just a really great plant that has been kind of undiscovered at the Arboretum for uh, quite some time. And as part of this uh, garden, um, as part of this grove, um, a golden larch was planted on the Arboretum's 50th birthday um, just to commemorate that event and to just add to the Founders Grove, um, continually add to that space. So one of my favorite gardens that we have um, at the Arboretum is our Memorial Tea House. Um, you can see here um, that it has some pretty good established shrubs um, however, this is one of the oldest areas of the Arboretum. I think it is second oldest to um, the Founders Grove. So it is actually a pretty mature canopy of almost exclusively native trees. So there's a sugar maple, a, um, a, a red oak grown from an acorn. Um, there's some honey locust and uh, Kentucky coffee trees, and I believe that there is a bitternut hickory in this space as well. And so we have one of our first gardens that we get to play underneath um, mature shaded landscape. So a lot of really great shade trees. Um, but this space is where we are beginning a Canadian hemlock collection. And so um, some previous curators began that process, and we have some really fun, um, lesser known varieties of um, hemlocks. And we've got seven or eight in that space, um, probably about a dozen at the Arboretum so far, um, and we're really looking to increase uh, our hemlock collection just within this uh, area of shade. So there you can see a, a weeping hemlock there with some young trees in the background. And here's what our tea house looks like overall. Um, so you can see that we have a little seating area there where people can just be really enveloped in that space. Um, and this garden is one of the closest to our outer edge. And we are surrounded almost exclusively by woodland, uh, really close to the Des Moines River. 
And because this space is so close to the woodland, we get to see some really interesting wildlife here. Um, I don't have any pictures, but we found Bob White quail hanging out in this garden. We found, of course, raccoons and possums and hawks and other birds of prey hanging out in this garden just because it has such a close connection to the nature around us um, and is really developing a really nice canopy with a, a, a good mature shrub layer there. Um, so we're very excited to see wildlife coming onto the Arboretum. But um, with the 40 acres, we obviously have a lot of space with that. You can see here um, a landscape of large mature trees with young trees getting planted every year. Um, and we're really looking to begin, as Mark said, programming this space. And uh, we're really excited to see new gardens developing um, kind of surrounding this uh, collection of trees. So one of my favorite Iowa connections to the Iowa Arboretum is that we at one time had a horticulturist who was um, a former president of the Iowa Nut Growers Association. Um, and nuts were really a, a large commercial product in Iowa and were really trying to be assessed for their landscape potential um, as landscape trees in urban areas. And so we host a very large nut tree collection that were really being evaluated for both their commercial value and their landscape value. And uh, this uh, former horticulturist planted almost completely from his own seed crosses. And so here pictured is a shagbark hickory that actually has 13 siblings planted at the Arboretum and they are very handsome trees. And so um, just looking to the future with the potential of um, planting more native plants in urban landscapes, what these uh, hickories can tell us about uh, what these plants have in value for the for really just urban plantings. Um, other things that he planted were things like red oaks and, and a lot of oaks from acorns that were all sibling crosses. And so we've got a lot of really unique um, nut and oak trees planted at the Arboretum. But you can see that there's just so much space um, and it's it's really peaceful and quiet and just overall lovely because you can see just so far across the Arboretum. Here's a picture from our deciduous windbreak. Um, I attribute it to um, saving a lot of the collection during the derecho. Um, it took the brunt of that uh, wind coming from the west and really preserved a lot of the collection that had the potential to um, potential to be destroyed. And so uh, this shot is really great because you can just see that line of uh, swamp white oaks there um, that helped protect a lot of our mature trees um, that made it through the derecho unscathed. But we have a lot of perennial collections, as I mentioned. Here's our stout daylily collection in front of one of our pavilions. Um, we've got a very extensive daylily collection, probably um, 400 to 500 varieties of daylilies alone. Um, and the stout collection just happens to be one of the best parts of that, uh, of that uh, daylily collection. Here is our perennial garden, which I'll talk about um, towards the end of the presentation about how um, we're using conifers to help revamp this space. But as you can see, it's a beautiful space. One of our guests' favorite places to go and wander around. Um, it's one of our oldest gardens. And so this was established at our old building um, where guests could just walk out of our our original education center and uh, be surrounded by perennials. Um, here you can see our new education center or our most recent education center. And uh, next to it is a dry creek bed planting. And so showing people how to plant in places that have seasonal moisture and uh, plants that are great for um, holding water in your landscape and to making sure that you uh, have the best when it comes to drought resilient landscapes. So our newest um, renovated garden um, was done in anticipation for hosting a HOSTA conference this next year. Um, however, this garden was actually torn apart because as you saw in those derecho pictures, 
we lost six white pines that used to stand kind of as centuries to this garden. And so hostas were uprooted when those trees fell over. The structure itself was, was extensively damaged and this garden um, needed to basically be started over from. Um, and so we planted a, um, a fresh batch of hostas, made sure everyone was labeled correctly um, and that we knew what everybody was. Um, and this is the result of that uh, garden being renovated there. One of my personal favorite gardens is a woodland garden, um, a shade garden that gets to show you a little bit of what it looks like um, across the street in our woodland. And so this takes guests down to the lowest in elevation point at the Arboretum on the main 40 acres. Um, where they get to see native things like um, black maples and oaks um, growing in their natural setting. There's a little bit of a wetland down there um, that we have a lot of fun um, planting in. And this is where you get to see a lot of Iowa rare plants. So things like durkas and uh, wahoo euonymus, and we have um, some native uh, pagoda dogwoods planted down here. And so really exposing our guests to some of the lovely native plants that are endemic to the area. Um, we have pawpaws down there as well. Just showing them uh, what the, the cool and, and interesting plants are that are native to Iowa. We've got several water features. This happens to be our pond with a weeping willow and butterfly garden. Um, butterfly garden isn't really blooming quite yet in this picture. Um, and then behind um, where our volunteers are planting irises, you can see a uh, prairie pothole or, or polystyrene wetland um, renovation there. And then this iris garden was actually just planted this year. So we hosted the um, um, National Iris Convention at the Arboretum in 2017. And we are looking for a permanent home for those irises that we got to keep as a host garden. And so we just, uh, are starting a iris garden um, out on our main 40 acres. This is just an example of the direction that we are potentially heading with one of our gardens. Um, this is an example of a meadow. Um, and so you can see there are some native plants intermixed with some non-native plants really demonstrating um, that fun mounding texture with grasses. Um, that is the potential for um, just meadow plants that do well in the area that you're at and the climate that you're a part of. So next I'll walk you across the street into our 120 acres of woodland and prairie. Um, this is our woodland in its spectacular fall color. Um, we have um, ravines that drop in 100 feet in elevation. And so there's a large elevation gradient between a flat tabletop land and then steep ravines that take you down into uh, the Richardson Creek Bend. So we also have a uh, um, couple dozen acres of prairie. This is our big prairie here, where you can just see expansively surrounded by woodland. Um, it is prairie. Uh, um, reconstruction. They're not native prairies. Um, this was originally farmland, um, but we're very appreciative to get to see what um, Iowa prairie reconstructions look like. This is our prairie about mid-June, just completely blanketed in a foxglove penstemon. Um, it has a lot of different seasons of interest in our prairie, and we are very appreciative to have it. Um, and walking through it just throughout the summer just gets to be spectacular. A lot of native plants, things like Baptisia bracteata, um, our yellow flowering Baptisia, um, the flowers are unique in that they uh, creep across the ground rather than being um, what we think of as like a spike when it comes to um, Baptisias. We've got amorphas that are seeded in there and some pretty big um, butterfly milkweeds um, and some really interesting gentians, prairie gentians, um, that could potentially be hybrids with their native woodland counterpart. So going into the woodland, um, we have a staircase that actually uh, goes down the ravine. 
Um, there's 133 steps down that. Um, and so uh, it's it's a lot easier going down than up, I will say. Um, it's a lot of a lot of elevation to cover. Um, but we've got three miles of woodland trails, um, and we're looking to expand um, those trails by almost a mile in this next next year or two. Um, but you can see here that the native woodland is just so spectacular. The fall color in the summer as well. Um, and we really love being over there. And it uh, is home to a lot of really great native ephemerals, um, some rather rare ones for this area of Iowa as well. Things like trilliums, snow trilliums. Uh, we've got some great hepatica diversity across the street, um, culver's roots and all kinds of uh, bleeding hearts, native bleeding hearts and uh, just a really great diversity of native woodland plants and ephemerals over there. So I wanted to get into some of our current projects. Um, I mentioned that we're renovating the perennial garden um, and we're actually using um, a reference garden grant that we were awarded this past year. And the kickoff is we are actually adding in um, some columnar conifers into the perennial garden to give us some vertical depth to add some really great texture into the perennial garden um, and just to help really bring that garden together. Uh, there's not a lot of vertical elements going on in that garden. Um, this is part of a replanting effort post derecho. So we're really adding it to um, the especially upright plants that we lost. We lost a lot of columnar things because of the brunt of the wind. And so just adding to that collection and we want to really increase our diverse varieties across our conifer collection um, and stay contemporary when it comes to our collections. So these are things like um, arborvitaes and uh, Japanese white pines. And uh, let's see, there's a taxodium bald cypress in there. Um, and one of my favorites, uh, Junipers virginiana taylor, some taylor junipers. So here's some more pictures of what that garden looks like before. Um, pretty beautiful, um, but you can tell that there's some gaps where uh, trees previously were before the derecho hit. And we're just really looking to uh, fill in that space and give it again some, some depth in the vertical element there. And so um, these plants are very young still, um, so they'll be developing over the next couple of years, but we're very excited to see where this project goes helping frame pathways and entrances to just really bring that garden together. We're also using um, upright conifers to really define garden spaces as we um, turn focus from keeping plants solely in collections into using them in gardens. We really want to create an intimate feel surrounding these gardens. Um, so we're using uh, hedging or living fences and to also help protect collections from damaging winds in the future. And this overall will help us strategically lead guests where to go. You can kind of see here with this example in the old Hosta house, um, the one that I was talking about we renovated, um, we're actually blocking the view of a parking lot by using these arborvitaes. So we'll be slowly ingratiating um, upright conifers into gardens to help uh, steer eyes and people where to go. So I want to touch on a future project that we have going on. Um, I have actually partnered with the California Bot Botanic Garden in Claremont, California um, to help start a conservation grove in Iowa. So um, I'm talking about Modoc cypress and Paiute cypress um, from the Sierra Nevadas in California. And uh, during previous uh, work with these plants, it was seen that they have a strong potential to be hardy in Iowa. There are people in Colorado that are able to grow these pretty well in zone 5A. And so we're kind of evaluating whether or not that's something that we can do um, here. But the reason why they need help with conservation is that their natural reproductive cycle required fire and fire suppression in California has severely disrupted their reproduction. So um, their cones, uh, need fire in order to open. And with fire suppression, those cones have not opened in quite some time, potentially even decades. 
And so they have not regenerated or created new um, generations of these plants. Um, both species also have potential to become ornamental plants. And so we could evaluate them in conservation in the way that we create varieties that would be available to the public or in urban spaces. Um, so pres preservation of genetic diversity in both species is becoming extremely important, especially as uh, plants that have not reproduced yet start to die off in the Sierra Nevadas. We wanna make sure that we have as much genetic material on these plants as possible. They have an extremely low germination rate and they do not have a strong potential for long-term seed storage. Um, so the, this is a picture of six of those plants that we started from seed this past March. Um, and out of close to 300 seeds, we only got about 25 to germinate and only 11 are still alive. Um, so really hard to keep this plant alive. Um, and so we're looking to really bolster um, the population even in captivity to, uh, to hopefully preserve these two species and see whether or not they can be grown in Iowa. So that is the end of the Arboretum tour. Um, and we would openly invite for anyone who might have questions to, to ask those questions now. Um, yeah, David, we have a couple of questions that were in the chat box. Um, Conifers and other species of tree uh, fared well from the derecho. So, um, a lot of our trees, or at least our conifer trees, most of them weren't the ones that got uprooted. A lot of them had um, either the top, like third or top half, snap off. Um, and so, while we might have lost we lost a lot of white firs. We lost a lot of Aves con color, um, which was unfortunate, but we have a lot of white pines that interestingly enough made it. We've lost probably half of our white pines. We had probably close to a dozen of them. Um, and they survived with just the tops of the trees and the, the apical meristem coming off. We didn't have the whole tree splitting or uprooting. Um, so our pines fared pretty well. Um, we had Korean pines that did not see hardly any damage. Our spruces did pretty all right. Um, so we we were very fortunate in that the most of the trees that we lost were were deciduous trees, and a lot of them were one that we have multiple specimens at the arboretum. Um, but did not lose a lot of conifers, which was good, uh, at least in in whole. We didn't lose a lot of conifers, so. And a related question to that, David, is um, if a conifer gets severely damaged, in other words, the like one that was photographed, the whole top was broken off, um, what do you do with it? Do you leave it and let it try to recoup on its own um, or take it out or what do you do with it? Yeah, um, so derecho recovery has kind of gone in stages. And so the first stage was really to remove anything that was officially dead, anything that had been uprooted, completely snapped, um, that was not going to survive. All of those trees were removed um, and, and taken off the grounds. Um, anything that still um, had potential to be okay was then assessed um, by the former curator and an arborist. And so they took a look at the damage that might have happened to that tree. They took a look at the overall shape to see whether or not they could train it to recover um, or um, really assessed it for how uh, precious it was to the arboretum, if that was something that was gonna be really hard to find again, or if it was rare um, and basically went through multiple screenings to figure out whether or not that tree was going to um, be worthwhile trying to keep at the Arboretum long-term. And so the trees that we have left that have um, derecho damage were ones that were assessed over and over again that, that they were going to make it. And we have not seen losses again since then. So none of our, none of our trees that have been assessed since then have had further damage or 
I have not seen rot problems or uh, trees falling apart any further. So they did a really good job of assessing whether or not that plant was worth saving um, or if it was gonna be able to recover on its own. Um, when it comes to, we have a pretty extensive ginkgo collection and some of the ginkgos got hit pretty hard. And so on those, I'm looking at grafting potential. Um, if it was significant enough that it altered how the tree was growing, or if there is potential for rot, um, we're looking at grafting those varieties back um, to preserve them. Sure, and, and ginkgos are pretty easy to prune almost any shape you want them to. So you can right. kind of shape them up again over a three or four year period. Yep. Dennis, mm -hmm. Dennis Groh has a comment. Uh, it might be useful to understand if there were notable differences in the wind resistance of tree species which survived the high winds. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, my first role when I started at the Arboretum was really to um, assess what was left after the derecho. We haven't had a lot of time. Um, losing 350 trees took a lot of time to recover from. And so now we're finally getting into um, the data and the assessment of these trees to really see what made it. And so I'm really hoping to have some publications available here in the, in the coming months or coming years to say, here's what survived. Um, here's what does well with that kind of significant hurricane force winds. Um, and really getting into um, what the implications of the derecho was to um, our tree growth and collections. So I agree, knowing what survived is going to become really important um, and we'll be sharing that information eventually. Thank you. And as many people uh, are interested in this question, the, uh, this person asks, how do you manage deer? Yes. Um, so I very tactfully hit it in the photos, but the main 40 acres is surrounded by a 12 foot deer fence. Um, that was not installed when the Arboretum was first started. Um, however, um, curators and executive directors alike were getting sick and tired of deer eating the collection. And so uh, we, we installed a deer fence all the way around. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any other questions? David, while we're waiting for additional questions, are there any uh, special hours during the year when you're not open? Is it seven days a week and what are the hours and the best time for people to visit? Yeah, uh, we are open for the most part every day. Um, we close down on the weekends in winter just uh, to slow down on staff pressures there. Um, but otherwise, we're open every day, um, generally from 9 o'clock in the morning to 4 p.m. at night. Um, we like to say from sunrise to sunset. Um, my favorite time at the Arboretum so far has been um, early, early June when we've got all of our perennials, our favorite perennials in flower. Trees are in flower at that time or have some really significant fruit. Um, or course, midsummer, last week of July, first week of August, when the daylilies are in bloom, because the garden is so significantly daylilies, it's almost overpowering with the number of, of blooms that are in bloom at that point. Um, but fall has a special place in my heart. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of nut trees and oaks at the Arboretum, like almost half of our deciduous collection are nut trees and oaks. And so the fall color at the Arboretum, especially this year, was just outstanding. And so you can walk the Arboretum and then go across into the woodland and see um, some really great native fall color and all the, the oaks and, and nut trees on our main collection. Uh, one participant asked, uh, what are your sources of funding? Mark, if you... I can take that one. Yeah. Um... We um, are not connected to a university or a major community. So we're a standalone nonprofit. So our funding comes in through, uh, mostly through contributions, but uh, we, wrote, we write a lot of grants and we have different fundraising activities that go on throughout the year. Uh, uh, we do have a small endowment, um, but those are 
kind of our sources of income throughout the year. And one more question. Uh, one of the participants uh, asks, is the Arboretum going to participate in conifer trials? Well, that is actually something that uh, I am hoping to start. Um, I'm in the process of negotiating with a couple of companies about starting a woody plant trial at the Arboretum. Um, and we're hoping to start maybe by fall of this year of, of 2023, starting woody plant trials at the Arboretum. Um, we've got acres and acres of space to, to play with woody plants. And so that's one thing that I wanted to see was just what can we definitively grow in Iowa? What are companies interested in, in showing can grow in, in the humid, hot Midwest? Um, and so conifer trials are definitely going to be a part of that, hopefully. Um, I just need someone on board for that. Uh, that seems to be the end of the questions, Byron. Okay. Will that be an end of the questions? I wanna thank both Mark and David. Absolutely stunning pictures on a cold winter day. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, Sherry Spath. Thank you, Tess Park. As I said, without, okay. without the volunteers and the co-hosts, uh, we would not be able to put these on. So thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, next Saturday at the same time, we will have another presentation. <clears throat> and as I said, that will be the Frederick Meyer Garden and Sculpture Park in Michigan. Once again, everyone, thank you for attending. Look forward to seeing you next week.